Welcome to this edition of History and Highballs, Missing History, Jewish Life in Western North Carolina. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History. So whenever you join us for one of these History and Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually spend the evening together listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so incredible. Uh, if you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. Uh, this is also where you can find out more information about joining our wonderful North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which, in addition to many other things, helps make programming like this evening's event possible. Uh, we would like to thank those of you who donated funds towards this evening's program. We continue to do our best to keep our programs free to attend, um, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to be so thankful for your gener generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. Um, we ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our intern will ask as many ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. Speaking of our intern, y'all might have noticed that we have not one but two new faces joining us this evening, our guest speaker and our new adult programs intern, Hannah. Hannah will be with us through the summer, so you'll see her around both virtually and at our in-person programs. Welcome, Hannah. It's my honor to introduce and welcome the second new face joining us this evening, and that is Sharon Parr. Moved, uh, Sharon moved to Asheville in 1996, partly because of its rich history and architecture. People drawn to Asheville often reinvent themselves. Sharon is a recovered environmental planner turned history geek, armed with a BA in, ge in geography from Clark University and a master of urban planning from Wayne State University. She began to document Asheville's Jewish history with Jan Soket. Socket. Socket, yeah. thank you. <laughs> in 2003, to <laughs> capture the memories of people who knew Asheville's downtown in its prime and to better understand her adopted home. History at Hand has grown to offer walking tours and provide interpretive panels for buildings and outside exhibits. To date, she has authored over 40 panels on a wide array of topics, including Black and Montford history, as well as important sites and people of local history. Sharon has done extensive work enhancing an archive on Jewish life in Western North Carolina at the D.H. Hyden Ramsey Library Special Collections at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. She chaired the 37th annual meeting of the Southern Jewish Historical Society in Asheville and currently serves on the board of Jewish Heritage North Carolina, as well as the research committee of the Community Remembrance Project. Jan Shawet, Shawet, Shawet. Socket <laughs> and Sharon co-wrote two books, The Family Store, A History of Jewish Business in Asheville, North Carolina, 1880 to 1990, and The Man Who Lived on Main Street, Stories by and about Saul Shulman. Sharon also wrote A Home in Shalomville, A History of Asheville's Jewish Community. Sharon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Stacy, and welcome, Hannah. I'm very excited to be here tonight. I wish I could see all your faces, but I'll just have to use my imagination, I guess. And when I moved to Asheville, I really had no idea about the long and rich Jewish history here. Uh, my friend Jan just said, we need to document it. No one's ever done that. And what did I know? I said, well, sounds like a project. Okay, here we go. Uh, but it's it's just so much more than just Asheville. And today we're going to look at a few of the towns that are in Western North Carolina. Um, some of the places we're going to touch on besides Asheville are Blowing Rock, Boone, Brevard, Bryson City, Canton, Franklin, Hendersonville, Little Switzerland, Marion, Pisgah Forest, Robbinsville, Rosman, Statesville, Silva, Valley Cruces, and Waynesville. 
who knew, you know, <laughs> who knew? Um, now, wait a second. Oh, here we go. So the first question is, you know, what brought Jewish people here to uh, the mountains? Well, actually, it was not a new thing. The first Jew was a guy named Yachim Gantz, and he was a metallurgist. He came here with the second expedition of Sir Walter Raleigh in the 1500s. But, uh, you know, they didn't make it this far west. The majority of Jews immigration, well, Jewish immigration came much after him. And uh, the first wave were from Spain. They were Sephardic Jews and they were escaping the Inquisition. Then next came the Germans who lost their civil rights after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815. And then the Eastern Europeans escaping the pogroms and army conscript conscription in the 1880s. So how did they get here? Well, the railroad was the major means of transportation. And universally, immigrants would follow the rail lines wherever they went because that meant economic opportunity. Um, there would be needs for jobs and goods and services so they could open businesses or have jobs. And they stayed in the places that could support their businesses and they moved if things didn't work out. So they were very fluid, they had to be adaptable. So also, so many of the immigrants came to big cities, New York, Philadelphia, even Houston. And these were crowded and had bad living conditions and they wanted a better life for their children. So they went to less populated parts of the country. Also in our area, a lot had to do with health. So people were seeking cures for tuberculosis. They wanted to escape malaria and yellow fever, which were low country illnesses. And so they came to the mountains. And the other reason that people might have come is called family chains. They would write home to their relatives or their friends and tell them about how beautiful it was here or how they needed help in their store, or maybe they should come and open up a business. So they had to be good at making something out of nothing because they were so restricted in Europe as to what they would be allowed to do. They couldn't be in certain trades. Um, so they often became merchants or even peddlers, you know, selling whatever they could to whoever would buy it. And this continued after immigrating to the United States. So what did they do? They're in a new country, they don't know the language, they don't know where to go. But there were wholesale businesses such as the Baltimore Bargain House, which was in Baltimore, and they would help these immigrants. <clears throat> they would set them up with merchandise and give them credit and tell them where to go. You know, they knew what territories needed coverage. And they would begin often by peddling on foot and with a pack. And then as they got a little more prosperous, they might get a horse and a wagon uh, until they could afford to have their own stores. So the standing joke was, you know, how did you end up in Waynesville? And the answer would be, the horse died. And uh, Jacob Rader Marcus always had a saying. He said, whenever an uncle, uh, whenever a Jew showed up in a town, his uncle was there to greet him. So uh, 
you know, there, there were people around, but they weren't in any great number. And Eli Evans called them pro provincials, but really they were not. They were very cosmopolitan because they had connections outside of the South, outside of Western North Carolina. They were connected to people in New York City where they got their merchandise or Baltimore where they got their merchandise. Um, after reconstruction, when the South had no money, they were able to borrow money through their networks in New York or Philadelphia or wherever and bring money into the South. They also knew what was happening in Israel and in Europe. So we'll start with Asheville and Asheville being the largest city in all of Western North Carolina has the largest Jewish community. And there were over, we documented over 450 Jewish businesses in just in downtown. This isn't counting the ones that weren't, that were by the River Arts District or in other areas. And during the period from 1880 to 1990. And once the railroad came here in 1880, people could get here in larger numbers because prior to that, the roads were bad and you had to come on a stagecoach and it was a rough, rough journey. So finally, by 1891, there was enough of a community to support a congregation. And the congregation was called Beth HaTefila. And it was conservative. By conservative, I just mean they had to figure out how are immigrants who speak Yiddish and assimilated Germans and people everywhere in between who had different traditions, how were they going to worship in the same place? Well, you know, they didn't was the simple answer. And so by 1899, we had a second synagogue, Bicker Folim, which means healing the sick. And that had a lot to do with so many people here with tuberculosis. So the people of this congregation would make chicken soup and take it to uh, the Jewish patients. Bicker Folim today is conservative. Beth HaTefila is reform. So those are different interpretations of the traditions. And uh, today, Bikr Cholim is congregation Beth Israel. And Asheville also has a secular congregation and a Chabad, which brings back uh, the orthodoxy. So many uh, people in Asheville's Jewish community owned or worked in retail stores. But there were some that engaged in manufacturing, they made clothing or shoes or something, and steel fabrication and tanneries and junk and waste processing businesses. So the junk business goes back to, you know, we buy everything and we sell anything. So um, that, that what goes back to the, you know, making something out of nothing. There were also a few families who owned restaurants or grocery stores, and some people were just salespeople, sales clerks that worked in the stores. But many of these business people believed that if you live in a place, it's your responsibility to improve it, to make it a better place. And their influence reached way beyond the proportion of their numbers. Because even though we're talking about these congregations, we're talking about you know, 60 people, 100 people in the, in the 60s, the 40s, I mean, the 40s and the 50s, there were maybe 700 people. So we're never talking about a huge number of people in proportion to the general population. And they, yet they were able to create a strong collaborative community where they realized the success of one contributed to the success of all. And that's, that's a lesson that 
you know, we should take to heart in these days. Just saying. Hmm. So this is my all time favorite picture. And I hope you can see it. This is uh, the Lewis and Son department store in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And here is um, Buster Brown with his dog and they're selling shoes in front of the Lewis department store. And it's the early 1900s. So Hendersonville is the second largest Jewish community in Western North Carolina. And their congregation started in 1922, but they had a very small Jewish population and they were embarrassed that if people asked them, you know, where, where do you go to church? They, they said, well, we, we don't have one, you know? Um, so, but they were unable to uh, raise enough money among themselves. So in order to build this synagogue, which you see on the left, uh, they sent out a letter asking anyone who had a, you know, knew a Jewish person to please join in and contribute so they could have a synagogue. And actually they did it later again in the nineties when they built their new synagogue. Today that synagogue is like a Salvation Army or some kind of a thrift store, but you could still see where it was a synagogue. And Hendersonville was also, it was like the Catskills of the Appalachians. So people came in the summertime, there were kosher boarding houses, and they had dances, and they also had Jewish camps. And Jewish camps were important opportunities to help youth connect with Judaism, because many of these families, there was only one or two families in town, so they didn't have a synagogue, or their, their children didn't have enough other Jewish kids to socialize with. And especially after World War II, uh, they needed the camaraderie and to rebuild their Jewish identities and re get renewed from the atrocities of the Holocaust. So the camps served to strengthen their Jewish connections. And Jewish youth would come from all over the South to Camp Osceola. Blue Star, Camp Judea, and Blue Star and Judea are still there. And then other camps nearby were Camp French Broad in Brevard and Camp Delwood in Waynesville. And they were there during the 20s. So they were much earlier. Camp Blue Star was founded in 1948. Then we have Wildacres retreat in Little Switzerland. In 1936, philanthropist Dick Blumenthal, you maybe have heard of the Blumenthal Center and there's a lot of Blumenthal things in Charlotte. He bought 14 acres in Little Switzerland that once belonged to a Ku Klux Klansman named Thomas Dixon. And this became a conference center dedicated to the betterment of human relations. And it was an interfaith thing there. Uh, it served cultural groups, civic groups, uh, and it still is very popular today. In 1948, the B'nai B'rith Institute brought world renowned speakers to them, to this place. And so again, it's reinforcing communal bonds. Now, again, when, when I'm talking about Jewish youth, teenagers, there's not enough in you know, many of these little towns, Silva or Waynesville. So they had a fraternal component and it was called AZA, 
which stands for Alpha Tzedek Alpha. These are um, Hebrew words. And it was uh, overseen by the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization. B'nai B'rith is a national Jewish organization. Uh, and the initials stood for Fraternal Love, Benevolence, and Harmony. And it was established in 1924 as a strong platform for leadership development. So these kids, you know, were going to be in touch with their Judaism and they were going to go out and be leaders in their community, not just for Jewish things, but for everything, for, for all kinds of causes. Then we have Boone. Well, in the 30s, a guy named Shorty Davidson is living in Boone, and he wants to marry this woman from New York. But she's not moving to Boone if she can't get kosher meat. So kosher meat is, you know, ritually slaughtered, and so it's certified that it's humanely killed. And so Shorty had to go to um, Winston-Salem to learn how to be a shachet. That's what you call this butcher. And um, he did, and they got married and she moved to Boone. In 1974, a small group of, oops, sorry, <laughs> Jews started meeting. And in the summer, what we call halfbacks from Florida would come up to, uh, the area. They would rent ski chalets. And we call them halfbacks because now they live in Florida, but they were probably from somewhere up north, New York, Chicago, something. And we're halfway back. So in 20, 2008, uh, they built a synagogue there. And the congregation is a mix of App State faculty, retirees, and business people. And in the 1990s, a Jewish cultural group formed in nearby Beach Mountain, that's like the next community over. And this prompted Appalachian State University to bring in renowned Jewish speakers like Ellie Wiesel. And later they started the Center for Judaic Holocaust and Peace Studies which are still part of the university today. So maybe you've been on the Blue Ridge Parkway and you've seen this big white house at Blowing Rock. It's um, a gift shop for uh, the Southern Highlands Crafts Guild, but it was built by Moses Cohn. So Moses' father, Herman Kahn, they changed the name to Cohn, uh, was a German Jew, and he immigrated to America in 1846. And he started as a peddler, and eventually he opened a store, and he had a wholesale grocery business. Well, two of his 12 children, Moses and Caesar, uh, were like salespeople for him. And they began to see that there would be a need or an opportunity for them to invest in textile mills. So in the 1880s, they bought the Graham Manufacturing Company in Asheville, which later became the Asheville Cotton Mill, which unfortunately an arson burned most of it down, but there's still a section, it's in the River Arts District today, that is called the Cotton Mill Studios, and it has artist studios in it. Well, when they bought places like this, um, they would send a relative to oversee the operation. And so they sent their sister and brother-in-law, the Longs, uh, M.D. Long, and he was the one who oversaw the operation of the plant. Uh, Moses and Caesar went on to amass the South's largest textile empire, Prosperity Mills, and they were the first to brand 
flannel and denim, you know, to put their name on it, Prosperity Mills. Before that, it was sort of an anonymous kind of a thing. And Frederick, who was the youngest brother up there in the corner, uh, he was an early president of Congregation Beth HaTefila. So he was here in Asheville too for a short time. And then he moved to Baltimore where his two sisters, the famous art collectors lived. And their art collection is in the Baltimore Museum of Art. They uh, were friends with many of the Impressionists and they lived in Paris and they knew Gertrude Stein and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they would actually spend time in this house in the summertime. And Moses built it, it he was inspired by the Biltmore estate. You know, here's a wealthy person building a grand house. So, uh, but he chose a colonial revival style because he, he wanted to look assimilated. And this was to him, you know, the symbol of Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. So this is why it looks like that. And today, all the acreage and this house is part of the Blue Ridge Parkway. Oops, sorry. So now we're back to Silva. And um, Saul Shulman, who you see pictured here with his jacket on, came to Silva when he was 19 years old in 1933. And he had a, a clothing store for 71 years. And in the beginning, people said, ah, oh, you know, it'll never be successful. People were wearing overhauls and he's selling, you know, prom dresses and bridal gowns and things like that. But he was a savvy businessman. And he was part of a family chain. So he had a store in Silva. One of his brothers had a store in Hendersonville, another one in Canton, Bessemer City, and Marion. And they might all be called Shulman's Department Store, but they were all individually owned. And they might all buy merchandise together to get a better price so they could buy things in larger quantities. When uh, Saul came to Silva, there was three other Jewish families, the Lessings, the Carps, and the Simons, and they were all merchants in Silva. And Silva is next to Kulawi, so for a long time, this is where students from uh, Western Carolina University would get their madras shirt, shorts and shirts and things like that. When uh, Saul was very philanthropic, when he went out of business, he well, I should say when he closed his store, he didn't really go out of business except to close his store. Um, he donated all the merchandise, but it, at, by that point, it was like going shopping in a vintage store. Everything was from the 60s and the 70s, pretty much. So now Franklin, who, you know, who would even think that there were Jews in Franklin? But during World War II, an ensign named Milton Sanders, who came from Franklin, served in the Royal Navy, and he was decorated by the king for entering the flaming wreckage of a plane and dismantling bombs. Very brave person. And you might have watched A Hole in the Head, which was a movie based, um, screen, the screenplay was written by Arnold Schulman. So Arnold would be the nephew of Saul, and he wrote a story about his life. So Arnold's father, Jaime, who was played by Frank Sinatra, this had a pretty big cast, had a retail store in Franklin, but just for a little while. And maybe there was another Jewish family in town. But then Arnold's mom died when he was 11. And Jaime just left. He left a key to his store in the door 
and a note to call his brother Saul and Silva, and he left Arnold at 11. So the family got together. This is the Depression, and Arnold went to live with his grandfather Shulman in Bessemer City, but he was very unhappy. And so he ran away and he lived in the basement of Radio City Music Hall. So, you know, he was like the phantom of the opera. And this is a true story. And he goes on about, you know, he had many adventures after that. And there's a series on YouTube called A Writer Speaks. And you can uh, Google it and go to A Writer Speaks with Arnold Schulman and get more of his story. And today there's the Mountain Synagogue, a congregation in Franklin uh, that meets seasonally, but doesn't have a building, a synagogue. They just uh, meet, you know, in different locations. So what other little towns can we talk about? Well, Rosman in 1904, the local mountain hamlet of Toxaway changed its name to honor Joseph Rosenthal and Morris Omansky, who were the business partners of Joseph Silverstein, who owned the local tannery and timber company. So Rosman is a combination of Rosenthal and Omansky. In Statesville, which isn't technically in the mountains, but um, there is a connection, the Wallace brothers came to America in the 1850s and they changed their name from Wallach to Wallace and moved to Statesville in 1857. They opened a general merchandise store, but it turns out they bought and sold medicinal herbs. They also traded. So if uh, you brought in your herbs and you needed a chair, you could trade your herbs for one of their chairs or a bolt of cotton or whatever. And this grew into a major operation. And they would have offices here in the mountains and teach people how to harvest the herbs sustainably so they could keep having a supply. And by the late 1880s, the business had a sales volume of over $100,000 a year, which I don't even know what that is in, um, you know, 2023 $20, dollars, but it's a lot. And their customers were all around the country, Europe and Japan, because Japan, they like black cohosh and ginseng and things like that. And they were in several world expositions and they won prizes for their uh, exhibits. So in Brevard, Norman and Shelley Bussert put an ad in the Transylvania Times and they said, are you Jewish? If so, call Norman. And it's an example of Jewish communities forming in rural towns. The response prompted the formation of a congregation and they, they don't have a synagogue, but they do have a congregation. Stepping back to prior to World War II, in Pisgah Forest, Harry Strauss founded Acousta Paper Company to make cigarette papers because the Americans figured out that all the cigarette papers prior to that were made in France out of linen. And they knew that if the war came, they were not going to have a supply of cigarette papers. And Harry Strauss, knew how to make the cigarette papers. And in Pisgah Forest, they could also grow flax that they used to make the paper for the cigarettes. Well, he brought his nephew Karl Strauss from Germany in 1936 to escape Nazi persecution. And Karl became a lawyer in Asheville and he was dedicated to eliminating intolerance, prejudice, and discrimination, which he considered a disease because he had seen it firsthand in Germany. And he was a big supporter of the University of North Carolina, which I might add has 
six buildings and a track named for people from the Jewish community. And Carl's name is on the track because he always ran. He liked to, he was a runner and he would always go to UNCA to run around the track. Now, Waynesville doesn't have their own congregation, at least that I know of. And people there would maybe come to Asheville uh, and join congregations here. But in the 1920s, they had Camp Delwood for girls, which was a Jewish camp. So here are some examples of enduring legacies. In Asheville, we have something called the Urban Trail, and there are markers all around town. And the Downtown Association wanted to honor the enduring legacy of the 450 Jewish-owned businesses. And they said they brought a wonderful vitality and spirit to Haywood Street and other downtown streets for over a century, beginning in the 1870s. And these merchant families advocated for local education, arts, culture, and health care, which fundamentally shaped Asheville. And I may say that th their reach was way beyond the proportion of their numbers. So, um, and then you had the Rosenwald schools. Well, Julius Rosenwald was from Chicago and he befriended Booker T. Washington. And Washington, you know, explained to him the plight of the rural black schools, which were way underfunded, way, you know, even non-existent. And so he convinced Rosenwald to be a benefactor to create these schools for rural black children. And in Western North Carolina, we had Mars Hill, Shiloh, which is a neighborhood in Asheville, kind of across from where the Biltmore Estate is across Hendersonville Road, Brevard and Silva. And even though the students didn't know who Rosenwald was, his picture hung in each school and he made it a community effort. So in order to get a Rosenwald school, he had to get the buy-in of the white community and the black community. And how did he do that? Well, mostly the white community would be the state board of education. And the black community was, well, they had very little money, but they pitched in time and effort and he would donate materials. and. They've just um, re renovated, I guess restored uh, the Rosenwald School in Mars Hill. They, they were all pretty much a basic a variation on a very basic design. You know, they might have two classrooms or four classrooms. So uh, if you'd like further information on this topic, we have our Jewish Life in Western North Carolina collection at UNC Asheville's Hyden Ramsey Special Library Special Collections. And you can search around uh, and see family collections and business collections and the collections of uh, several synagogues, Agudas Israel in Hendersonville, uh, Beth Hatafila, Beth Israel in Asheville. We also have Jewish Heritage North Carolina, which has Jewish highlights for many of the communities around North Carolina. And actually in for Asheville, we've done a virtual walking tour of Jewish sites in downtown Asheville, and you can access that on Jewish Heritage North Carolina, jewishnc.org. We also have Buncombe County Special Collections, and they have pictures of many of the downtown businesses and um, some of the JCC archives, Jewish Community Center, and 
so you can Google around in there and look for different things. Most of everything they have is online. And if you're interested and you want to see some of my interpretive panels, you can go to my website at historyathand.com. And you can see the different topics. And um, in, in the book, uh, oh, oh, what happened? Oh. Um, and the book, A Home in Shalomville, on the cover there that you see, uh, that has pictures of all the people that have buildings named after them on the campus of UNCA. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to some of your questions. Hannah? <laughs> Hello, that was super interesting. I learned so much. <laughs> okay, thanks. So got a list of questions ready to go. Okay, so one of the questions was, what kind of reception did these Jewish immigrants find in Western North Carolina communities during the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries? So that's an interesting question. Um, this is a very religious area. We're the buckle of the Bible belt. And, you know, to some people, the Jews were the chosen people and they were fascinating. They would bring their babies to the Jewish merchant store and ask him to say a prayer over their children in Hebrew. That that was, you know, a, a very honored, honored thing to do. Um, there you know, there was anti-Semitism, but not, um, not really too much because A, there weren't enough Jews to be any kind of a threat. So um, it was, you know, most people were accepted or uh, didn't, um, didn't deal with it. Um, Saul had a big, had a funny story when he wanted to build his house he went to this builder and he said, you know, will you build my house? And the guy said, no. And he, Saul kept asking him and the guy kept saying no. And finally, um, Saul figured out that, you know, he didn't, he never, probably the guy didn't know anything about Jewish people and he didn't want to build the house because Saul was Jewish. But he finally agreed to build the house if Saul would not interfere. He, you know, not be hanging over him all day. Well, the house uh, was built and Saul was very grateful. And so he gave the guy a suit. He said, I want to thank you and I want to give you a suit. And the guy said, oh, no, no, you know, I can't afford that. I can't take it. And Saul said, no, I'm giving you this suit as a gift. So the guy gets the suit. Well, in each pocket, Saul had stuffed money. And the guy, you know, finds all this money in his pockets. And he says to Saul, you know, if you have any more Jewish friends who need a house built, send them to me. So it was, it was an interesting uh, kind of situation. But, but when Saul opened his store, he got visited by certain people who said, you know, you're not going to be successful here. Um, okay, cool. So on the second slide, it was the one about building up from nothing. Um, someone was wondering where that picture was taken and the date of the picture. Oh. You knew. Um, well, I got those two pictures happened to come off the internet and I just Googled peddler. <laughs> sort of thing, or Jewish peddler, you know. Great. Okay. So while somebody said that while the Black population in Western North Carolina was very small compared to other parts of the state, how did Jewish business people in these mountain communities interact with Black customers within the constraints of Jim Crow? Well, thank you for asking that. Because Jewish merchants, and so in Asheville, we had uh, the Black Business District was called the Block. And yes, it was the Black Business District, but there were Jewish merchants who had businesses there. 
And they had a whole different perspective on their black customers. First of all, they treated them like customers. They gave them credit. They let them try on clothes. This was not done among Southern business people. So, and these people lived in their homes. They taught them how to uh, cook kosher dishes or uh, things for the holidays, special holiday dishes. So uh, it, was, it was a very different attitude than uh, the Southern norm might be. And in fact, we had a doctor here, several doctors, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Sprinz of Eisenblatt, and they would take their, their patients in the order in which they arrived. They didn't, nor, the norm was you take all the white patients, the black patients could sit there all day. They did not do that. They treated them like patients and took them in their turn. Okay. Um, so another question, during the 1930s and 40s, did Jews living in Western North Carolina experience significant anti-Semitism? Um, and then this person specifically mentioned the silver shirt leader, William Dudley Pelly, who was based in Asheville and also Asheville native, Robert Rice Reynolds, who was an outspoken opponent uh, of, yeah. Okay, so Pelly. Um, Pelly was not, the, the Jewish community was very nervous about Pelly. He went around town with two bodyguard silver shirt type people, you know, sort of like bouncer people. And he had his hateful uh, Pelly Publishing Company, which if you are in Biltmore Village and you go into the Southern Highlands Crafts Guild, you can see a picture of them taking his printing press out of there. Um, and he was run out of town. So the the Asheville community did not like having him there either. He didn't have supporters in Asheville. Uh, he was a screenwriter in Hollywood and he had an out of body experience. And he said the vortex brought him to Asheville, you know, so uh, well, that's the vortex part's not unusual. But anyway, um, so the Buncombe County Sheriff and a few uh, local lawyers ran him out of town on securities fraud. And he went to Noblesville, Indiana, where President Roosevelt caught up with him and put him into jail for subversion to the government. Now, Bob Reynolds, our Bob, that was his nickname. And he was a virulent, you know, uh, isolationist and anti-Semite. But, you know, he used to play poker with Lou Pollock. So, you know, there's this view, it's called not my Jew. Okay, so you, you have a feeling about Jews as a race or Blacks as a race, you know, but individually, you're friends with them. Okay. Um, okay, so then someone else asked, since the cones sought to assimilate into mainstream American life, did they purposefully avoid active involvement in the Jewish community? Well, you know, I did show you that um, their youngest brother was involved in the temple and their brother-in-law, M.D. Long, was a founder of Beth HaTefila in 1891. But he, part of the family did become Protestant. And uh, Down Home is a movie a video about the history of the Jews of North Carolina. And one of the people they interview is a descendant of the Cones. And his father was Jewish, but he let his mother, you know, uh, raise the kids however they wanted. And so he grew up uh, as a Protestant. And then uh, when he was in college, he went with some friends up. They had a home in the mountains, I guess, a summer home, and he went with them. And when they came back, the father said to his son, you know, I don't want you hanging around that Ben Cohn guy, you know, he's Jewish. And, and Ben just, you know, he has to say, wait a minute, you know, 
I, I was brought up in the church. No. Nope. So it, it, that was an odd, uh, you know, anti-Semitism too, that it's sort of once you're Jewish, that's how people see you or something. Okay. Um, These are and great then, questions, by the way. They're really <laughs> making me stretch here, people. <laughs> um, and then you mentioned WCU. Um, were there any stories of note regarding students at WCU connecting with or receiving support from Silva's earliest Jewish community or broader Western North Carolina Jewish communities that you encountered in your research? Well, you're going to have to stay tuned on that because this summer we're having an intern who is going to look into just that topic, you know, the relationship of Western Carolina University to the to their Jewish students, Jewish faculty, you know, we don't, we don't know that yet, but we're working on it. Amazing. Um, okay. Somebody else was wondering if you had an idea of current number of Jewish owned businesses in Asheville. Um, not really. In downtown, there's very few because, you know, we're talking about a time period when everything was in the downtown, the big department stores, you know, and once the people, the businesses moved to the mall and the big box stores came, you know, it, it was the demise of that downtown economy, that, that family business sort of, uh, you know, handing it down to generations. However, I will say that Tops for Shoes is in its third generation in downtown Asheville. Very exciting. Okay, and then there's been a couple questions about the Jewish community in Western North Carolina and how they responded to Nazi Germany, if there were any efforts to get people out of Germany, if there were any efforts to relocate people after the war, if there was any advocacy um, as it was happening, just general questions on that subject. Well, uh, so it was very difficult to get people out of Germany. I mean, to, and to get them into the United States. Uh, there's, you know, many examples of letters of people in Germany pleading to get out. But, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing that you brought up. So in 1933, Hitler closed the Bauhaus in Germany. And a way to get out of Germany was to have a job at that time in, in an, you know, any place out of Germany. And so um, that is the same year, 1933, that Black Mountain College was started by some professors from Rollins College in Florida. And so professors from the Bauhaus were able to come to Black Mountain College. And we had the other example of Carl Strauss, who also was rescued. So um, yes, when whatever people could do, they did, but it wasn't easy. And after the war, we had several families that were Holocaust survivors um, at, that came to Asheville. Uh, some of them worked for um, Enka, you know, uh, there was a Dutch company here. They were chemists and things like that. Um, but yes, and they became part of our community and a very important part of our community. In the picture on the cover there of a home in Shalomville, you see some kids with a teacher. Well, the teacher there is Hilda Hoffman. And she lost her entire family in the Holocaust. And she came here with her husband and she said, this is going to be my family. And so she made it, you know, she was a very important part of the Jewish community. Okay. Um, sort of on a similar note, people were wondering about how um, the Jewish community in Western North Carolina responded to the civil rights movement as that was happening in the 1960s. Well, um, so if you were in business, you know, it, it was often you didn't want to speak out because that would mean an end to your livelihood. You would lose your customers. And so people, many people helped financially 
without you know being in the forefront. However, uh, one example was Harry Winner. Harry Winner had a department store which he bought in 1944. The first thing he did was take out the colored and white water fountains and put in one water fountain. He was the first to put a black mannequin in his window. And in the 60s, he went around to the other department store owners and convinced them that the right thing to do was to hire black sales clerks all on the same day, and then none of them would be boycotted. And that's what they did. So, uh, and, and he did many, many other things to help with integration. So, you know, it's hard to generalize. Everybody had their own way of dealing with it. But um, we had an organization, for instance, called A-Score. And these were the black high school students that were trained to do the sit-ins because we didn't have black college students like they might have been, you know, Greensboro or these other places. And they were financially supported by people from the Jewish community. Okay. Um, and then also another question sort of in the same vein about if the Ku Klux Klan threatened Jewish people at all? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, that's a funny story too, because we have several instances where the Klan actually asked, you know, Jewish people to join. Now, I don't know if that was being naive of them, but we also have the joke that the Jewish merchants knew who these people were in their, you know, hoods and robes because they could see their shoes and they sold them the shoes. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, and then someone else was wondering about general marriage patterns of early Jewish business pioneers, if they imported Jewish brides or intermarried with local women. I'd say both. Uh, so I told you that they were cosmopolitan. If you had a business or a factory, you needed to go to New York. And we have the case of uh, Milton Lurie, when, where his uh, father went up to New York and the supplier said to him, look, I've got, he's looking for a, a son-in-law and the guy's dealing with in New York says, um, okay, I've got two gringos, green, green horns, you know, who just came here, you know, I've got Jaime and Saul. And so, you know, the father goes and talks to them and he says, you know, if you come down to the mountains, I'll put you up in business. And, you know, if you marry my daughter. So uh, yes, in a lot of cases, and you had Shorty um, up in Boone, in a lot of cases, yes, they would marry people, even Harry. Harry married a woman from New York and they lived in Canton, North Carolina. And she said, you know, I couldn't have been more different from the townspeople, but they were so happy that Harry married a nice Jewish girl. You know, they were happy for him. And so it was that, but then we had people who assimilated, you know, they, I mean, these kids grew up going to school with all the kids in the town, right? Uh, or they went off to war or, you know, so it was, you know, you, you can't generalize. Some, some people assimilated and some people, you know, married in the faith. Okay, and then one last question. Um, a few people mentioned Governor Vance and how he sort of stood up for anti-Semitism in North Carolina. And people were just wondering how that generally affected the Jewish population in Western North Carolina. Well, you know, if anybody ever read his speech, A Scattered Nation, uh, they would not think that he was standing up for any Jews except for German assimilated Jews. Uh, that's the best way I could describe it. And that's because he had a friend, you know, he when he was being sent to federal prison uh, and he was walking in Statesville to the train, this guy comes along and offers him a ride. And bingo, you know, he met his first Jew and they, they stayed friends. But he was very against, well, he put Jews in four categories. 
you know, the darkest skinned Jews that might be from Arab countries, um, you know, the, the Eastern European Jews and the, and, and he said, you know, something bad about all of them, except for the assimilated German Jews. So, you know, he, people, some, for some reason, people think that he was standing up for Jews. And with it, to his credit, this is a time of anti-Semitism when Jews were the Christ killers. So nobody was talking in support of the Jews, really. And he did, when they redid the North Carolina Constitution in 1868, Jews were not allowed to serve. Heathens were not allowed to serve. And he said, you have to judge the Jew as an individual. You cannot judge them as a race. And they have something to offer us. So they should be allowed to serve in the legislature. And it was changed from that time forward, 1868, Jews were allowed to serve in the state legislator, later. All right, thank you so much, Sharon. This was an awesome talk. Um, as Hannah said, same here, I learned so much and it was such a wonderful evening. Thank you for, for sharing all of your scholarship with us. Well, thank you for asking me. You know, I enjoyed it and I look forward to enjoying more of your programs and the highballs. I didn't get a chance to have a highball. That's right. You, you've Next earned time. more than that, I think, definitely <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and thanks everybody for listening and you had some really good questions. Absolutely. Um, and we hope that we'll see you guys at our next uh, adult program, History at High Noon, Amplifying Asian American Voices. That'll be happening over Zoom uh, this coming Wednesday, May 24th, starting at noon. We'll see you then. In the meantime, take care, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye.